If you remember from before, we had cemented her provisionals with a little Duraline. And um, as they've been in there, you can see her soft tissue just looks beautiful. That's the other benefit of working through that grafting procedure where we preserved her edentulous ridge. And, uh, and then we really sculpted the tissue using our provisional restoration. Learned a lot of this from Walter Gephardt and Terry Foey, who have been a great influence on me and, and really the whole soft tissue aesthetics. So a little temporary partial. We're going to put all this back in when we get done. And uh, Beverly is numb. Sometimes we don't numb a patient when we want to put in uh, and, and, and do a pickup. But last time, she was pretty sensitive when we were taking them in and out, so we elected this time to go ahead and numb her up. Let me show you something else that's really cool. <laughs> and I'm, I don't hawk products or anything, but this to me is a real lifesaver. But this is a crown remover, temporary crowns, but I've actually gotten final crowns that have been finally cemented off with this thing. This is a really excellent device. It's basically a pair of pliers with some little rubber feet on it. But the secret sauce in this whole thing is this carborundum powder. You dip the little rubber feet in carborundum powder. Now you can get a really good grip on the provisional without gouging it or breaking it. I have gotten off as large as a, what, eight unit bridge with this without breaking the teeth. And that's a real lifesaver. I believe GC makes this, is that right, Kathy? GC makes these things. And I give these as Christmas presents to the dentist that I work with because it was a Christmas present for me. Every day's Christmas around here, though, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so we'll just tease this off. I'll rock it back and forth till I start to see it move a little bit. And hopefully we won't pop a margin or whatever. Here we go. And if you'll notice, most of the cement's in the provisional, but occasionally you're going to have cement stuck on the teeth. If that's the case, what I recommend you do is just poke down on the cement. It breaks into big sheets and comes off the teeth. Okay, so we'll put this aside to save. The preps are really good and clean. I want you guys to take a real close look at that inner dental papilla right there. We talked about this last time. But by supporting that tissue with a line angle in that provisional and running that line angle right up under the tissue, that interdental papilla has just been pointed up nice and sharp. But take a look at the ponic areas. And by supporting that soft tissue, not only with our graft, but with the ponic, we have created a really nice interdental papilla on either side of the, of the ponic. Now, you remember that model I showed you, that Geller model or the Manier model? Terry goes in there and he sculpts that and he actually puts a little pressure. He just uses a, a barred parker, a sharp barred parker, and puts a little pressure on that to keep that, that papilla nice and supported. Because what we've learned over the years is that if you don't support that papilla, it's going to go look for something to give it support. And so on both sides of the ponic and on the abutments, I also found out when Terry and I were working together and he would come over and work with me in the office, I wasn't preparing the tooth interproximally in this area enough. I wasn't going far enough down gingerly to give him room to come off the margin and support that papilla. And so there was one long afternoon he was in here and we kept going and kept going. And if you think about where the bone is relative to the interdental papilla, it's five millimeters. So you've got five millimeters to work with. And so you should be at least two millimeters under there, and then you still have three millimeters of biological width to work with. So when I was in school, though, they just really didn't want you doing that. But what we've learned, Frank Spears and John Coyce and those guys, they refer to it as a bag of water that you can push the interdental papilla around. I, I would rather refer to it as supporting the soft tissue. We've got our uh, crown and bridge. We've got 360 degree porcelain butt joint margins. And as you can see, when I put this in now, the ponic area blanches. I wouldn't let that freak you out because what Terry did when he was making this ponic is he scraped a very lightly, in fact, he described it to me like this. 
He just got rid of the, the stippling or the orange peel. That's it. So that as we put a little pressure, those interdental papillae are going to be supported. Same thing on the other side. We'll try this one down. And as you can see, in just a few minutes, the blanching will go away. Okay. Go ahead and bite together for me, please, man. And one of the first things I'm going to do is let's go ahead and check her occlusion. Go ahead and tap, tap, tap for me now. One more time. Okay. Open. And again. Tap, tap, tap. Open. Now, as we've learned many times, the labial and size of line angle of the lower anterior tooth is that critical stop. So that needs to be a stable stop on the backs of these teeth. That looks pretty good. Now you got two choices. I've got a little heavy on 24 and 25. I can reshape 24 and 25, or I can reshape the lingual of 8 and 9, or I can do both. I also see a little bit of contact on this bicuspid on the distal of this canine, which I definitely want to get rid of. Don't want that. So let's initially change the linguals of these. And here's my little contacts. A little heavy here, a little heavy here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use just a little wheel diamond. And if you'll uh, go back and look at some of the literature, they talk about having a little tiny bit of long centric and creating just a little flat spot for that lower incisal edge to hit. Now. This is not our last opportunity to adjust the occlusion. I'm just taking a pickup today. We'll be able to get this on an articulator, send it back up to Terry, and while they're fabricating the partial, we'll still have the opportunity to, to reshape. He'll even be able to repolish and, and put a nice smooth finish on this. So I use an electric handpiece, and I'm gonna bump the electric handpiece down to 20, what's that, 2,000 RPMs or? 20,000 RPM or something like that. It's a low speed, and it, I like it because um, it's not going to chatter as much. Just the tiniest bit. Don't you like me doing this outside of your mouth instead of inside your mouth? <laughs> Most people do. The nice thing about the three models that we talked about, the solid model, the Geller model, and the actual working sought out model, is they were all made against the same lower with the same face boat and the same bite record. So all three of those models are interchangeably mounted. So the mounting is the same for all three of those models. So Terry can take them from one to the other and not have to worry about the occlusion being different on one model or the other. Every once in a while, you'll find that the proximal contact on the anteriors will be just a tiny bit heavy. And what you'll find is the best way to determine that is if the lingual margin of the crown and bridge is open, then your proximal may be holding you up. But using that solid model, you won't find much of that. Okay, let's try again. Tap, tap, tap for me now. Open. Tap, tap, tap again. Okay. What I like to do is keep my fingers on the labial surface of these things and you can kind of feel if there's any frematis at all. A little bit on that bicuspid. So what I'm going to do, since the bicuspid is already temporarily cemented in there, I'm just going to lightly adjust that in her mouth, kind of get that out of the way. I like this wheel diamond because you can actually put it facially onto a tooth and point up, if you will, that labial and size or line angle just by using the end of the disc, not the side, but the end. And then when we get all finished, what I'll do is I'll take a rubber wheel that we use to polish porcelain, and I'll polish the labial and size of line angle. Tap together again for me now. Ooh, that feels better. Tap again. Nice. Okay, I'm going to touch one more little spot. Bite together for me. Thank you. Typically, when I've got two bridges like this that are not connected, 
I adjust them like it's a six unit bridge. Don't adjust one and the other because when you put them in together, invariably, they'll be a tiny bit different. Now I'm not going to repolish this because we're not going to uh, cement these permanently today. But Kathy, what I'd like for you to do for me is let's go ahead and uh, mix a little flow temp. And what I'm going to do is put as tiniest little flow temp down in these and hold them in position so that while I'm talking, they're not going to drop on me because I'm going to be using a transfer base in a minute and I don't want to have to keep holding these things the whole time we're talking. Those beautiful porcelain butt joint margins, we don't want to do anything to mess those up. And all I'm going to do is the tiniest little bit on the labial surface of the inside of the copings. Temporarily cemented a bridge on a lady not too terribly long ago. Never did get that sucker back out of there. It's been 22 years. Temporarily cemented. Nothing more permanent than a temporary solution. What we've done now is we let our little flow temp set and it's going to hold those uh, two bridges in there while we work on the transfer base and everything. Sometimes if I, uh, I'm taking a quick pickup of uh, maybe a couple of crowns or two, I want some minimum in, um, but I find that this is much more stable, especially since I'm going to be working at a little transfer base. Here's our transfer base from when we took our final impression. It's got the cutouts for where the implants are, and so it, we know it fits in her mouth. Real wide for me now. I'm just going to slide that in. Just make sure, bite together, that there is, turn away from me now, that there's plenty of clearance between the transfer base, the implant, healing caps, and the opposing teeth. And we've got tons of room in there. When we use our transfer base, what we're going to do is just an old-fashioned border mold technique that you learned in dental school. We all learned it. And with a transfer base that fits this well, we don't have to really do a lot of border molding, but I'd recommend that you, you actually border mold it because sometimes an alginate impression will have a short margin or you wouldn't have picked up the hangular notch or something like that. So let's fire up our flame. Yeehaw. And I use gray stick compound just like we were taught in the old days. I'm going to put it in this flame. This can be a messy procedure, but if you do it a lot, you get pretty good at it. I'm going to add that border on. Now, Beverly, let me go ahead and tell you, I'm not going to put this thing while it's still hot in your mouth. It'll be warm, but it's not going to be hot. I want to kind of concentrate in this corner back here where you turn around the maxillary tuberosity. Then I'll fire up my little torch. Then I'll temper that in some warm water. And then I'll wet my fingers and I'll, I'll move it around with my fingers kind of get it the way I think it should look. But you know, one of the reasons for border molding and doing it this way is one of the ten principles of partial denture design is to provide a brick-like stop, particularly when we're using a uh, rigid attachment. The other thing is to equalize support throughout the soft tissue. And that's exactly what all these little steps are going to do for us. And they're going to fulfill those two of the ten principles of partial denture design. Just warming and tempering until I feel like it looks good. And I'm going to jump over to Beverly's mouth. And notice I'm just doing one side at a time. Okay. Real wide for me now. Thank you. 
I'm going to hold it in the palate with my index finger. I'll take my other hand, and I'm going to pull that cheek out, down, and in. And I close about halfway from me and move your jaw side to side. What that does right there is the coronoid process of the, of the mandible actually will create a little flat spot on the lateral portion of that border molding right there. That keeps that partial from being dislodged or banging into the lower. And so what we've got is we've got just a little bit of gray stick compound and we picked up the tuberosity into the hamular notch. You may have some other way that you were taught to border mold, but this is the way they taught it at the Medical College of Georgia. Had good success with it over the years. Once again, I'm concentrating on that tuberosity, hamular notch area. Use my fingers again. Give me a nice little starting point. I can even put a little post-palatal seal in here. One of the things Dr. Jack Turbyfield will tell you is if you can make the pink stuff fit, if you can make the partial saddles fit, the teeth will get a tremendous amount of stability from the soft tissue. And he's exactly right. Dr. Turbyfield is one of my main mentors, and I'd encourage you to, anywhere you can find him and hear him speak, I would encourage you to go do it. He's an excellent teacher. I'm just warming and getting it to that magic temperature. We'll jump over to Beverly's mouth. I'm on the left side now. Right side's already done. So I'll, thank you, sorry about that. I'll switch fingers, hold the palate with my right, come over to the left and go out, down, and in. And I'm going to have you close about halfway and move your jaw side to side, side to side. Okay. Now we'll slide that out. And as you can see, we got a nice little round around there and a flat spot right there where the coronary process of the lower hits. We got a nice little post palatal seal right there. Got a little excess right there, but I might trim that off with a knife. But that's looking pretty good. That would pass with Dr. Ron at the Medical College of Georgia. Okay. I'm going to slide this back in Beverly's mouth. I'm going to make sure that I don't have anything in the way. And that little bit of gray stick compound right there is kind of eking up on my implant um, healing cap right here. So I'm going to trim that off with a sharp barred Parker knife. Okay. Before I trim that off, I'm going to immerse this in ice water. We use these little aluminum trays, uh, these little aluminum bowls. And the ice water gets the um, gray stick compound brittle hard. I'll warn you about these things. I burned a hole in my uh, wallpaper one day by turning that out of the way. With a real sharp barred parking knife, I'm just going to trim that little piece of um, gray stick compound that I felt like was in the way. Alrighty. Now, with that border molded, we can now use this as, in essence, a custom impression tray to make an impression of the soft tissue, irrespective of the crowning bridge. So I'm going to have Kathy dispense some rubber base. I like rubber base to be used for a soft tissue impression. I think it offers the best impression of soft tissue. You may differ in that opinion. You can use whatever you want. But I still think rubber base is the best soft tissue impression material. So let's uh, put some adhesive on this 
and let's go ahead and put some impression material out. We went ahead and moved all of our flame and our hot water and everything out of the way. And I put a little rubber base adhesive on our tray. You want to use that very sparingly. You don't want to just pile it on there. And you also want to make sure your rubber base adhesive gets over the gray stick compound, gets out over the edge. The rubber base adhesive will dissolve the gray stick just a little bit, so be a little mindful of that. But as you can see, we got a nice coat and we've gone over the edges. Now, I use a little bit of heavy body and a little bit of light body. About 50-50 heavy body and light body. People ask me all the time, why don't you just use medium body? Well, medium body is 70-30. Heavy, heavy to, to light. I want about a 50-50 mix. I want really a light wash of impression material. And I think the medium's too stiff, too stiff. So I use a 50-50 mix, and it's exactly what we were taught in school. Um, I'm going to mix this rubber base, and if you notice, Kathy has put out a small spatula, and I'll actually load the impression tray with a small spatula. Take note of the fact that Kathy is over drying out Beverly's mouth with some two-by-two -two sponges. When I have a homogeneous mix, I can go ahead pick up that rubber base and I want just a thin wash almost like your ice and a cake because there's just not going to be a lot of room for impression material making sure that I've I've come over the edge. Okay, now we'll go to Beverly's mouth. Kathy's got it all ready for me. We'll slide that in. Using my index finger again, I'll push her to place. Now if you'll hold that for me, please, ma'am. Kathy's going to hold it. And what we like to do is take a little cotton tip applicator and get rid of any excess that could be choking a poor patient to death. Okay, I got it. Now as this sets, the initial set, I'll border mold just a little bit using the same movements out, down and in, out, down and in. Now, I'm going to have you go side to side for me now. Close down by halfway. Had a girl. Okay, now relax for me. It's been eight minutes, and that's how long it takes rubber base to set. And so we're just going to pop that out of there. One of the things you'll notice is the rubber base flowed and covered up the healing caps of the implants. And we didn't get a whole lot of excess, which you don't really want a whole lot of excess. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a scalpel and... I'm just going to trim that excess off just a little bit because I don't want a whole lot of excess and I want room to put my impression copings for my implants. All righty. And Kathy usually puts a little pair of scissors out over here. Yep. And I'm going to trim right back to what would be the vibrating line. And I'm right at the fovea palantini right there, which is telling me where the vibrating line is. Okay, so now we have a transfer base that has recorded the soft tissue. Now, if I put my uh, implant impression copings in there, I'm not going to be able to take a bite record. So what we've done is we've tried our crown and bridge in, we've adjusted the occlusion, we've recorded the soft tissue. What we want to do now is prior to putting our implant impression copings on is go ahead and take 
the bite record and we're going to use silicone putty. On my transfer base, I've got those notches cut in like we showed you when we made our final impressions. And so those are going to serve as a keyway for our putty. I'm going to put this back in Beverly's mouth. Now if you were doing this with a transfer base on the upper and lower, you'd want the lower transfer base in. We're not doing that. On the lower, we're going to do an immediate reline. So we're going to make that putty go over the edentulous ridge. Okay, Kathy's mixing away over there. And bite together for me now. Man, that looks good, Beverly. That's going to be nice. Okay. My transfer base, open really, really wide for me now, fits really well. So it's not dropping down or anything. And that rubber base is serving a really good looting agent. Bite down for me now. A lot of times I'll take my finger and just kind of push from the buckle. Push that putty up so that I've got a really good recording of the soft tissue of the lower. Now stay together for me now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our putty has set, and as you can see, we've recorded the soft tissue side and we've recorded the transfer base side. Soft tissue side, transfer base side. That's easy to trim, and I will be honest with you, the labs like this stuff because it's clean and it's easy to work with. It's very durable if you're mailing to your lab and that kind of stuff. Now. If you think about the whole process, if you think about the whole process of what we're doing, um, we got to get a lot done before we take this final impression where we pull the crown and bridge. And you got to be thinking way ahead on this stuff because we had to get the transfer base relined. Then we had to take a bite record before we take the final impression. Then we have to, if we're going to make a new face bow, we need to do it right now because you can't do it after you've taken the the pickup because the crowns aren't going to be in her mouth. So if you need to take a new face bow, take it right now. Remember we had a clear duplicate of her temporary partial when we placed our implants. We tried them in at the time we removed her teeth and it helped us to position the implants and verify that we had the uh, right alignment of the implants. What if you wanted to use this as your transfer base? You most certainly could. It fits in here just the same way the transfer base did. It shows you where the teeth are. It's cut out just like the transfer base. But here's one big difference between this and the transfer base. With the transfer base, we have a little bite block in the back. With the clear duplicate of the temporary partial, we have teeth. So the bite record that you're going to make with this will be an open mouth record like with Delar Wax because you don't want the teeth touching anything. This you'll take as a closed mouth record tooth to tooth in the anterior. So that if we have tooth to tooth in the anterior and nothing in the posterior, there's no way that you can dislodge the condyles or anything. So my personal preference is to take the tooth to tooth in the anterior with nothing touching in the back and not have to rely on an open mouth record at this point. But you can certainly do that if you'd like to. Just remember, you're going to take an open mouth Delar record when you do that. <laughs> okay. All right, my friend. I'm going to wake you up and put this back in there. Now we've got our transfer base back in the mouth, and I'm going to sit you up now a little bit. We use what we affectionately refer to as a coys bow. I showed you this in the denture video. And this coys bow, I like. It's like a fox plane with a plumb bob built into it. Every time I think about that, I think about Lloyd Miller. Oh, Lloyd Miller was, was really way ahead of his time, and we all miss him. And uh, he used to have a plumb bob hanging from the ceiling in his operatories that he made sure that he had that X, Y, and Z axis all aligned. Well, John Coyce came out with this thing, and this is a penitent item, but we've converted it so that we can use it on a Delara articulator. Now, by virtue of the fact that we have a transfer base in the back, teeth in the front, instead of using the little stick-ons of compound, we're actually going to use putty on our little bite fork tray. This snaps right on here. 
Kathy's going to mix the uh, silicone putty. And when you put this in the mouth, let me push that up for just a second. There we go. When you put this in the mouth, you want to find the incisal edges of the upper anteriors. And then you want to align with the midline of a patient's face. I'm going to get in front of you for a second. Midline of a patient's face. I'm going to straighten your head up just a little bit. Okay. And then we'll put this putty onto our bite fork. And it's going to give us more surface area to contact around that transfer base. You can do this with your patients with natural teeth too. I'm going to make sure my transfer base is in all the way. And I'm going to go right to the mouth. I'm going to find those incisal edges. I'm going to lightly push up. The nice thing about the putty is I can kind of move it around. I'm looking to make sure that that's level with the horizon or with the eyes. I'm looking to make sure that we're in the midline of Beverly's face. And this is a great tool because when it gets to the lab, they can verify by using the back bow of the articulator as a leveling gauge. I'll tell you, since we've started using this face bow, we don't ever get a case back with the midline off or a canted midline. And it's all because of this plumb bob. Everything comes out level and plumb. We let that set for about four or five minutes, and then we'll be done. I'm going to go ahead and take this out because I'm ready to move on. And I'll just, when it comes out, it looks just like that. We've got nice indentations for the transfer base and all of the anterior teeth so that when we go to the articulator to mount this, it's not going to move around. It'll be very, very stable. All righty. Now that we've gotten our face bow recording, we're going to be ready to put our implant impression copings in. Now we're going to take our healing caps out. You got a, you got now here's a trick, ladies and gentlemen. One of the first things we always do when we take a healing cap out is Kathy has got these little syringes with chlorhexidine gluconate. And the first thing I do when I take a healing cap out is I irrigate the inside of the implant with a little chlorhexidine gluconate. When we put these in, and after they've been in for a while, maybe a little dried blood or, or something up in there. I'm gonna go ahead and pop this other side out. I know my head's in the way, but Something about me makes me want to be able to see when I'm working on a patient. I think I told you that when we were working, while we've been making this case and going through the process, I think the healing cap on the right came loose. Beverly called right away, Scala. But the... Uh, tissue had already grown up around those implants so much that we had to anesthetize her just to be able to get the healing cap back down in there. A little chlorhexidine gluconate. You know what those are? Those are the syringes that the phosphoric acid comes in for bonding. And so what we do is we clean them out and they got these little disposable tips. I also use these for irrigating endo canals. I'm going to use, try and use this again. Now one of the things I want to make sure I do is verify that this is down all the way. And there it goes. It dropped right to place. And these implant impression copings are so large, so long, that uh, there's no way I could take a bite record right now. The other thing I'll encourage you to do, turn towards me now a little bit, is to actually, once you get these down, or what you feel like is down, go ahead and make an x-ray and verify that your impression coping is all the way down. 
There's nothing worse than taking that final impression, getting it to the lab and realizing that it was off a half a click. As you can see now, we have transfer base, crown and bridge, implant, impression copings. She got a mouthful of hardware. Okay? I'm going to pull this out for just a second, Beverly. Mm -hmm. I want to loosen the crown and bridge a little bit. So we'll use that same little temporary crown remover. I'm just going to lightly loosen it because I want it to come off when I take this impression. But I want it to stay in place while I'm taking the impression. Okay. One last little trick I'll show you is that the top of the implant impression copings have a hex nut right there. And sometimes it'll keep you from being able to get your impression coping down into the impression. So I use a little bit of this rope wax, same stuff that the kids use on their braces, and I block out that hex so that when I go back into the impression, I don't have to worry about getting the hex in the right spot either. And it's just a little bit of white or clear wax. Now what Kathy's going to do, we've tried an impression tray on a model already of all of this, so we've got the right size tray. We're going to use the Acadet impression uh, system, and it's the system, what is it, one or two? Two. System two is for partials. System one is for complete dentures. And so the system two is a little different setup. It doesn't take it quite as long to set, um, but it gives a really beautiful impression. The critical part of this is uh, the temperature of the water has got to be right, so they provide you with a little thermometer. She mixes some of the impression material and puts it in a syringe. And then while I'm syringing the material into Beverly's mouth, she mixes the tray material. Thank you. And so I'll syringe into the vestibule and around the transfer base and especially around the little implant copings. The impression material itself is much stiffer, real wide, much stiffer than the uh, injectable. And it has, the, I'd say, the same basic qualities as alginate impression material. We're going to let that set for a few minutes. Okay, as we take it out now, what I want you to notice is, not only is this a huge impression that you just experienced, but here's my transfer base. Crown and bridge has been picked up in there. My impression copings will go in there, and what I want to do is I want to cut the edge of that down. And what you're going to see is basically a box beaded impression We'll have the soft tissue with a nice land area. And when we pour this, it's going to give us a land area here and here. We don't have to trim any of this out front. Now we'll take the impression copings out, pop them back down into the impression, and we'll be able to pour that up. Now, what I've done is we've gone ahead and taken the impression copings out of the implants in Beverly's mouth, and I've screwed on an analog, an analog of the implant that's in there. And the other thing that we like to try and do is keep the same impression coping in the same spot. Don't mix and match. Because if any reason they're not exactly the same, you don't want some sort of uh, discrepancy between one impression uh, coping and another. That slides right back down into the impression, and as you can see, there's my analog. We'll put an analog on an impression coping here. We'll screw that down. 
And then we'll pop this one on the left side in. Here's our transfer base. It's been border molded, relined with rubber base. Our crane and bridge is down in there. And there's our implant, analogs, and impression copings. This now will be ready to pour, and we'll show you how to do that in a little while. Okay, our next um, procedure that we're going to do is we're going to take a pickup of the lower crowns. They've been sitting in there the whole time we've been working and been working against our transfer base and our upper crown and bridge. But we're going to go ahead and pull those. Now, we're not using a transfer base in this one because I want to demonstrate to you in the final product how to do a immediate relining insertion so that when we put in Beverly's final stuff, we will reline the second that we put it in there. That's a procedure that Pete Dawson's been teaching for years and years, and I thought you would benefit especially since we've got three different types of partials we're making, we can do a different procedure for each one. I think it'd be more complete. So we're going to do the, as we say in the South, same song, second verse on this one. And uh, if you recall, when I talk about alginate impressions, I always talk about using the mirror to retract. And we've tried a tray in. We're using the accudent system again to take this impression tray fits really good and we don't need any wax on it. So Kathy will start out by mixing the injectable material. Again, we use the alginator, which is a machine that mixes the alginate. We find it gives a nice, smooth, homogeneous mix. And I would recommend that you use one of these. Initially, when they first came out with that, I avoided it. But I really think it is a nice quality control instrument. And just like before, I will inject some right over the ridge and under the tongue, up onto the crown and bridge, onto her teeth. While Kathy mixes the tray material, as I said before, the tray material is much stiffer. Real, real wide for me now. Thank you. You had a girl. And just like when we tried it in, if you'll lift your tongue up for me, and let it relax, and that's perfect. Very nice. Okay, now, we'll let this set. How many minutes, Kathy? Three minutes. Three minutes is the set time on this. I'd still tell you to monitor it a little bit. Last impression we took of that upper, we had to let it set a little bit longer. Stick your tongue out me again and relax it. All right, so our timer has gone, gone off, and we're going to try and slide this out of Beverly's mouth. Now, these can be very, ooh, that came out pretty good, very difficult to get out sometimes. And what I want you to notice now, this is kind of interesting. It's really good impression of the soft tissue and everything. Got my crown right here. Crown on the left side did not pull, didn't come out. That's okay. You're not to freak out about that because all I've really got to do Pop that crown out, and some of the preps you'll notice, I do a lot of boxes for resistance and retention form, and when you do that sometimes, it's very hard to pull a crown, and if you notice, it just pops right back down in there. No big deal. I'd make sure you didn't have any alginate or the accident material stuck under it when you put it back in there, but sometimes I'll pop them out of the impression and just to clean the cement out of them. Now what we're going to do is wrap this up with a little wet paper towel. We'll put um, Beverly's provisionals back in, same way we did before, with Copalite and Duralon. And we'll go back in the lab and show you how to pour these up using some dyes and some dye stone. Our next appointment then will consist of us placing our implant fixtures, our crown and bridge on the upper, our upper final partial, We'll put our crown and bridge on the lower, and then we'll put our final partial in, but we'll reline it at insertion so you can see that being done.